show you my shoes while we're waiting. I have new shoes. I noticed those. Did you notice those? Nathan Swore told me they make me look younger. See? Okay. <laughs> so, By all means, you need to wear them. Actually, what I said was, Nathan, you think these make me look younger? And he complied and said yes. So you can tell him that I told everybody that he said they made me look younger. What size are they? What size are those? <laughs> Those are full-grown men's shoes. Those are 13s. Wow. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Good to, good to be with you guys tonight and to study together. And uh, if you want to get your Bibles out and open them up, we're going to be in Genesis 22 is where we'll pick up. But we are, of course, uh, talking about the uh, big picture of the Bible, talking about the two covenants and God's uh, overall plan uh, throughout history to bring the Christ, bring uh, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, uh, the king who would sit on David's throne, all of those promises of the Old Testament to bring the seed who would crush Satan and uh, make reconciliation with God possible so that sinners like you and, and me, you and I could uh, be in fellowship again with God. That's what the Bible is about. That's the story that's being told. And we are nearing the end of uh, or winding up the uh, section that we've been in which has uh, for a number of lessons talked about Abraham and talked about the promise to Abraham. Um, and we'll kind of, kind of wrap that up tonight as uh, we start to look at uh, a couple of other elements uh, of the Old Covenant. But uh, we've been talking about that promise that God made to Abraham. We've talked about how it became a formal covenant. Remember, God had that covenant ceremony with Abraham with the animals and so forth. And we talked then last week a good deal about um, circumcision and the place of circumcision in the Old Covenant and how that compares and contrasts with baptism under the New Covenant. Some uh, important uh, um, concepts that we looked at there. And then now tonight as we pick up and start to move on, um, we are uh, going to see um, this covenant uh, repeated a couple of times, clarified uh, here in Genesis 22, and then repeated to um, Abraham's son and grandson, Isaac and Jacob. And so if you look here in Genesis 22, you may remember we first looked at it as God was calling Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and then he, he went up to Haran, and God called him again, and from Haran he moved down into the Promised Land, into what we know as Israel or the land of Canaan. And um, God was starting to make this promise, and, and um, this promise that uh, Abraham's descendants would be a nation, that he would form a nation of them, that they would have a particular land that would be theirs. Um, and then in connection with that, he was also making this seed promise that from the seed of Abraham, all nations would be blessed. And as that promise is repeated, it, it becomes more clear as you move through the scriptures. God begins to clarify it a bit, begins to define the terms of the, the land that will be included in the promise and that sort of thing. And so we'll see it here. Uh, in Genesis 22, verses 17 and 18, as God repeats it again to Abraham. Let's just read that together. Um, beginning in verse 17, God says, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will multiply your seed, or your descendants, as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies.' 
This, this is the nation land promise. He doesn't mention the land in this statement, but talks about these descendants that Abraham will have. They will uh, be this uh, nation of people. And then in verse 18, we see the seed promise again. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. And we'll really focus on this when we look at the fulfillment of this in the new covenant in Jesus. But there are three parts to this. He says, in your seed, um, what seed is he speaking of? Who is the seed of Abraham who is to come? Well, it's Jesus, Paul will tell us in Galatians. Um, in your seed, in Jesus, all the nations, not just the Israelite people, this part of the promise is not just for uh, the Jewish people, all nations of the world, all nations of the earth shall be, third element, blessed. And so we'll talk a lot about what is that blessing that God keeps promising. Um, that blessing is justification by faith. That blessing is the fact that we have opportunity to be in fellowship with God, not on the basis of our perfect law keeping, but on the basis of faith. That's that concept of being justified by faith, being right with God based upon our faith relationship in Jesus. And so we'll, we'll flesh that out as we get to that point. But you see it being uh, promised here again to Abraham. Now, who was Abraham's son? Who was the son of promise? Isaac. And who is Isaac's son? Jacob, who is also known as Israel. That's right. So we'll see now this promise to Abraham repeated both to Isaac and to Jacob. So look at Genesis 26. A couple of pages over. This is the repetition of that promise again, the Abrahamic promise. Uh, to his son Isaac. And you'll see it in verses 3 and 4. Genesis 26, 3 and 4. Sojourn, he, God is speaking to Isaac, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, which I, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands. Stop there for a moment. That's the nation land promise again. All these descendants, uh, they'll have this land. Uh, they'll possess this land. And then in the latter part of verse 4, and by your descendants, or by your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. There it is again. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then finally look in Genesis 28, and you see it repeated to Jacob or Israel. In Genesis 28, and this time it's in verses 13 through 15. Genesis 28, beginning in verse 13, God again speaking to, to Jacob. And behold, the Lord stood above it. There was this dream, remember, with the ladder and the angels um, ascending and descending. Verse 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south. Uh, and then here comes the seed promise. In you and your descendants or your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again, that seed promise. In your seed, all the nations or all the families of the earth uh, shall be blessed. And so those are not the only places that you see this promise, but again, um, God is simply repeating it. The initial promise was to Eve in your seed, um, or well, it was in reference to Eve. It was made to, to Satan and said, uh, you know, there'll be this enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Um, you will... Um, bruise him on the heel, but he will crush you on the head. And then God now is making this promise to Abraham uh, as we come down, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So 
little summary here and kind of looking forward. Where are we going now and what are we talking about? What are we saying about Abraham? God has said, God has made a physical promise to physical descendants. I have this physical promise. Your physical descendants, uh, the Israelite people, the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, they will have some physical blessings. They'll be a physical nation. And they will have a physical land, a particular land to call their own. And then secondly, God is, of course, making this spiritual promise, which is now, uh, or which is for all believers, that all nations of the earth would be blessed in this seed. And so here's where we're going, looking ahead. It won't take long on each of these three items, but let me show you what is added to that promise to Abraham to, to put together this old covenant. When we say old covenant, we're talking about this relationship that God had with the Israelite people, uh, primarily under the Old Testament, and then on into the Gospels of the New Testament. But as they operated under the old covenant, um, we had the promise to Abraham, but then there were some things that were added to that. The first that we will see, and we'll see this in just a moment, is that God added at Mount Sinai the law of Moses. He added a law that would govern uh, the behavior of his people. He then added at Moab a covenant of blessing and cursing, a covenant that would judge the people, that would bless them as, as they as a nation followed God and would bring curses upon them as they as a nation disobeyed God. And then finally, we'll look at the covenant with David when this promise is made that there will be an eternal kingdom, that there will be one who will sit on the throne of David forever. And uh, we'll look at that promise in 2 Samuel as, as God promises this eternal kingdom. And what we'll see is that together with the promise to Abraham, these Three, and obviously there are more that we could add, but these are, the, these are the primary ones. If you put these together with the promise to Abraham, you have a pretty good picture of that old covenant, of that relationship that God was establishing with these people. And, um, you know, keep in mind, he, he selected these people, he chose these people for a very special purpose. He didn't choose them to all be saved and for everyone who was not an Israelite to be lost. We've talked about this before. There were um, Israelite people who were lost, um, and there were non-Israelite people who were saved. And uh, we find that out in, in Romans talks about that, about how many in the Jewish nation missed the whole point that, of the relationship that God had with them. They pursued righteousness as if it were by law rather than as if it were by faith. And Paul talks about how even many of the Gentiles figured it out when the Jews didn't. And so sometimes we, we read the Old Testament and we think, well, the, these are God's people and, you know, these are the people um, God chose and he chose them to be saved and everyone else was lost. Many of the Jewish people felt that way. You know how they felt toward the Gentiles. They, they felt like they were all lost and outside of God's grace. But the reality is God was operating with people on the basis of faith um, from the beginning. That's, that's his way of dealing with mankind is, is by faith. And so um, it, you know, it, it, you, that wasn't a question of saved or lost. It was a question of God saying, I'm going to choose this nation for a purpose, and that purpose was to bring the seed. That purpose was to bring the Christ. That's why they enjoyed those blessings. That's why they enjoyed that special relationship, is because they were the ones God had chosen to fulfill this promise. And they were um, blessed because of it. They had many, many blessings that the Gentile world did not. Okay, let's look at the first on that list. Let's look at the covenant at Mount Sinai. And I would like you to turn on a few pages to Exodus. Uh, we'll be in uh, Exodus 24 in a moment if you want to go there now. Exodus 24, but we're going to talk about this covenant at Mount Sinai. Remember, um, God had promised, remember, that um, 
in the uh, remember that remember when we talked about God speaking to Abraham back in Genesis 15 and he said your people are going to go and be uh, enslaved for 400 years and he said in the fourth generation they're going to come out I'll bring them out of that slavery. And we, we know that that happened. We know that when um, they went into um, Egyptian, um, or went into Egypt, uh, who was the person who took them into Egypt? Who went into Egypt and then his family followed, followed him there? Joseph, right? Lots of stories of, uh, lots of uh, scripture devoted to the story of Joseph. As family followed him in there, one of his brothers was named Levi. He was the father of the, the Levites, the, the ones who became the priests under the Old Covenant. Um, and from Levi you had a son named Kohath, another, a son of Kohath named Amram, a son of Amram named Moses. And Moses then, of course, was in the fourth generation, Moses was the one who indeed brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And so, how about that? Just as God knew long before, that's what happened. And so they, they came out, um, and as they came out of Egypt, remember, God began that process of, of making them into a nation, forming them into a nation. And one of the very first things that he did was give them what? what we call the law of Moses. You know, remember they came out and they went to Mount Sinai. They were um, only out of Egypt for three months. The scripture tells us it was the third month that they came to the mountain and they received this law that God gave them. We call it the law of Moses. It's actually the law of God. It was given through Moses. It was given through Moses as a mediator, and we call it the Mosaic law or the law of Moses. But it's simply, it's simply their law from God that will govern the way that they live. God, God is again forming them into a physical nation, and so they need something to govern them. And the law of Moses, you remember, was very detailed. It governed the way that they lived. It governed the way that they did business with one another. It governed their worship. It governed lots of things in their lives. It was the law that would govern them. And what we began to see here is that in the enactment of this law, we start to see something really important in this story of the Bible, and it is this business of the role of blood in God's system. As the law was brought in and added to the promise, as the law became um, established to govern them, we see um, one of the early indications of the importance of blood. We're going to talk a lot about that when we get to the New Covenant. We'll talk more about the role of blood in the Bible and, and in God's system. Um, but suffice it to say, let's, let's, or let's just notice here a couple of things that when uh, in Exodus 24, when Moses was delivering this law to them, Notice the role of blood. You see that there were, uh, in the early part of chapter 24, there was worship taking place. There were uh, animals being slaughtered, blood being collected. Um, and then in verse 8, we read this. So Moses took the blood, that is the blood from these sacrificed animals. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it where? On the people. I always think that's strange, isn't it? He sprinkled it on the people. He, I guess, shook the blood at the people, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, I put Hebrews 9.19. We'll talk about Hebrews in just a moment. But... There's, he clarifies, the writer of Hebrews clarifies that the blood was sprinkled not only on the people, but also on the book of the law. So there was this ceremony where the blood was being sprinkled on the law and on the people. And Moses makes this, this statement, Behold, the blood of the covenant, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you. These, these covenants, these arrangements that God has with his people 
are enacted with blood. They're enacted with blood. There are um, uh, places where the Bible will emphasize Leviticus 17.11, for example, where it talks about, you know, the life is in the blood. There were, there were lots of instructions about not eating blood, about how they dealt with blood, about the role of blood in the sacrifices. The life is in the blood, and so he said it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement for your souls. There's this, there's this emphasis on blood, this emphasis on the relationship of blood. Um, even when Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, um, what is it that God did? When, when they realized they were naked, what did they do? They covered up with what? Fig leaves, right? God came along and covered them with what? Animal skins. God shed the first blood. God shed the blood of those animals and covered them, wrapped them uh, in, the, in those blood skins in this there was this there's this I think that's a foreshadowing of the importance of blood certainly throughout the Bible blood is so so important it's connected with sin it's connected with forgiveness it's connected with atonement and it is definitely connected with this idea of being in covenant with God and so in Moses day enacting the old covenant he says this is the blood of the covenant this blood from these animals. Now, when we look at the New Covenant, flip over to Matthew chapter 26, we of course see that uh, this phrase, the blood of the covenant, the idea of there being blood associated with the covenant is certainly true under the New Covenant. Look at Matthew 26 verse 28. What's happening here in Matthew 26, 28? What's taking place? Have a heading there or something that'll let you know? The Lord's Supper instituted. This is, this is Jesus and the disciples. This is, this is the, the Passover taking place and Jesus instituting what we continue to, to observe, the, the communion or the Lord's Supper. And as he's telling them what to do, he tells them to drink from this cup, verse 27, um, and then says in verse 28, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. So again, we have this emphasis on blood. Blood to enact or to establish the old covenant, and then also for the new. Let's look briefly at that Hebrews 9 passage. We're actually going to spend more time in Hebrews when we are um, looking at this transition from the Old Covenant to the New. But um, let's look at it here just briefly uh, because it refers to this process of Moses sprinkling the blood and now the blood of Jesus uh, and its importance. Uh, Hebrews 9 starting in verse 19. He's, he's reminding them, telling them of the, the inauguration of the first covenant with blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. That's what I was referring to earlier. Sprinkled the book with the blood and, and sprinkled the people with the blood. Verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way he sprinkled the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry with the blood. All, all of their implements of, of worship uh, also sprinkled those with the blood. Um, and according uh, according to the law, one may, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We hear that quoted a, a lot of times in, when we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, and is certainly uh, appropriate. Without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We drink from the cup and we remember the shed blood, uh, because it is the blood of the covenant. Um, and it's not the shedding of, of the blood of animals, it's the shedding of Jesus' blood. Um, and so uh, we'll stop there in Hebrews 9. We'll spend more time there next, uh, or when we get to that transition. But 
he talks there about, again, this transition uh, from the blood of the old covenant to the blood of the new. So we're talking about the law. We're talking about God adding this law of Moses, giving them this law that will govern their behavior. And it's important for us to notice um, the purpose of the law in Galatians chapter 3. So turn there with me. Uh, this also is a chapter that we'll spend some time in a little later in our study. But I want to pull out just a, a couple of verses tonight. Um, because as we talk about this law that God gave them that would govern their behavior, um, it's important to remember uh, the purpose for this law. Look in verse, start in verse 18, Galatians 3 and verse 18. Um, he's talking about here the, the promises that were spoken to Abraham. Uh, it, actually, if you look at verse 16, that's the one I was referring to earlier that tells us very plainly that Christ is the seed that we're referring to. He says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed. And Paul says, that is Christ. He said, back when God made this promise to Abraham, he didn't say, and, to your, and in your seeds, plural, all nations will be blessed, because he wasn't talking about those physical descendants, the Israelite people as a whole. He said, and to your seed, singular, and Paul says that is Christ. He was talking about Christ. So this promise of Christ and, and the inheritance that would come, now look at verse 18, for if the inheritance, that is this promise, this blessing, if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Now Paul's going to really start drawing this distinction between the, the promise that God made to Abraham and then the law that was added to the promise. Because um, the Israelite people um, had a real hard time with understanding uh, the concept that uh, we often have a hard time understanding, and that is that our righteousness doesn't come because we're such good law keepers. Our righteousness comes because we're forgiven. And this promise of Christ, this justification by faith, this forgiveness that we have. Now, we want to keep the law because we love God and we, uh, we, we, uh, we know that that's what faith does. Faith, faith believes and obeys and, and, and we want to please God. But we know that our righteousness it doesn't come because we've been such good law keepers. It's because, we ha it's because of the faith that we have in Christ. It's because of the relationship we have in Christ and this forgiveness. And so Paul's making a point here to say, you know, they often got so focused on the law, and that's what I referred to from Romans, Paul talking about them missing it. They, they pursued righteousness as if it were by law rather than by faith. They got so focused on that that they're, they're ticking off the, the checklist, you know, I've done this and this and this and this, uh, and therefore I'm righteous. Um, and they, got, they, they, they sort of lost the concept of faith. And so he's reminding them that um, when God made this promise to Abraham, when God made the promise to Abraham, was that before the law of Moses or after the law of Moses had been given? It was before, right? It was before Moses even came on the scene, uh, generations before Moses. So the promise had been given long before the law. He said, you have this promise, uh, this inheritance, this blessing was not based on the law, was not based on the law of Moses. It was based on a promise. It was based on God's promise to Abraham. That's 18. The inheritance is, if the inheritance is based on law, it's no, not based on a promise. But God granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Then he says in verse 19, why the law then? In other words, if, if God had made the promise, and he did, and the promise was good at the moment God made it, why then did he add the law? The law's not going to save them. They're going to be saved, forgiven, blessed through the promise. Why did God add the law? This is what Paul's asking. 
Why, was the, why the law then? Well, here's the answer. It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, that's Moses, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. We'll, we'll pick up in 21 in a mo or in the next verse in a moment. But he says this law was added um, because of transgressions. It was given through Moses, and it was until the seed would come. It was added to the promise on a temporary basis. We know that the law of Moses uh, is no longer in effect because the seed has come and the covenant is changed to the new covenant. Um, but this law was added, and it had to do with, with the transgressions. That is, it was, he says it was added uh, for, the, for, the, for, for the sake of, of, as we'll see in a moment, defining transgression and helping them understand their need for forgiveness. Look at uh, verse 20. Uh, no, not verse 20. Did I? Oh, 24. There we go. Need to look at my chart. 24. As he goes on talking, he, he says, Therefore the law has become our tutor, our schoolmaster, to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. So, so he's, what he's saying, and we'll, as I said, spend more time there later, but what he's saying is they, <laughs> they were not justified by law keeping. They weren't righteous because they were such good law keepers. They, they and us receive forgiveness based upon God's promise, based upon this justification by faith. He says the law was added to lead them to Christ. To lead them to Christ, to bring them to Christ. And the way I understand that to be is that the law basically defines um, what is sin in God's eyes. I mean, what, what constitutes a sin? How do, how do we know what sin is? Is it just something we don't like? If, you know, we don't like something, well, that must be a sin. What, what is sin? What does it mean to sin? It's to what? Transgress, break God's what? Break God's law. I mean, if God says don't do it and we do it, is that a sin? Yeah. If God says uh, do it and we don't do it, is that a sin? Yeah. That's, that's the idea. That, that's the only way we know what sin is, is to, is to have this law of God, which, which we have a law. We have the law of Christ. We have lots of commandments uh, in the New Testament. Um, and we uh, seek to obey them. Uh, again, not to be justified, but because we love God and we're thankful for our forgiveness. And so what he's saying is that law, that law makes us aware of our need for forgiveness. When, um, when I look at the law of God, when I read the, the law of Christ, when I read the New Testament, um, one of the things that happens is that I become very aware of my sinfulness, right? When you, when, you, when you start reading and you hold it up to your life and your thinking and the things that you've done, uh, what happens? Well, you become very aware of the fact that you haven't lived and don't always live up to God's standard. That leads us, as he says in verse 24, that leads us uh, to faith in Christ, leads us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. When I, when I see that law, I am to realize, you know, I can't stand before God as a righteous law keeper. What I need is something else, as Paul said. I need to be justified based on faith. That was the whole idea of this law of Moses. So, so they had the promise of God that, that the seed would come, that the seed would crush Satan, that, that all nations would be blessed in the seed. But then God added the law to govern them, and that law would help them become aware of their sinfulness, it would, uh, in connection with regulating their behavior and requiring sacrifices when they sinned, it would begin to lead them to Christ. It would cause them to understand that they needed something more than what they had. And that something more, of course, was Christ. So God gives them this law uh, to govern them um, and to... Uh, to govern their behavior 
um, under the old covenant. And again, it will continue until the seed comes, until the new covenant is established. Now, after they get the law of Moses to govern them, they get another covenant that we mentioned a moment ago uh, at Moab, and it is a covenant that will judge them. So look in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28. This is that covenant of blessing and cursing. It's uh, found in a couple of places. It's in Leviticus and then repeated in Deuteronomy. We're going to look at this Deuteronomy passage in Deuteronomy 28. But what God does is He gives them this law that will govern their behavior. And then on top of that, He says, "This I'm going to make a covenant with you that you're going to be judged based on how you live um, as a nation. And uh, gives them a very specific covenant here of being blessed uh, when they obey and being cursed when they do not. So let's look at some examples here in Deuteronomy 28, starting in verse 1 down through verse 14. We're not going to read all of that, but, but in that section he talks about these blessings that they will enjoy as they obey God. He's going to be, he's going to tremendously bless them as a nation. He says, now it shall be, verse 1, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, if, 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 if you'll obey, if you'll diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations, above all the nations of the earth. Just a very general statement to say, God is going to bless you tremendously if you obey. And, um, and, and look at what some of these blessings are. I listed some of them uh, up there on the chart. Uh, but uh, look at some of these verses. Look, at, he just starts listing them off, but jump down to verse 4. Blessed shall be, or blessed shall be the offspring of your body, the fruit of your womb, and the produce of your ground, and the offspring of your beasts, and the increase of your herd, and the young of your flock. He's talking about their children, that they'll be blessed with children. He's talking about their crops, that their land will be productive. He's talking about uh, prosperity, individual prosperity, these flocks and herds. He's saying, I'll bless you with these things if you obey me. Um, he talks about their military strength. Look in verse 7. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and shall flee before you seven ways. He said you will, you'll have military strength as a, as a nation. You see it again down in verse uh, 10. So all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. God says you will, you'll have this military strength as a nation. And uh, in addition to that individual prosperity, they will have national prosperity. Look in verse uh, 12. The Lord will open for you His good storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You as a nation will be prosperous. Pe nations will come to borrow from you, not the other way around. Now all of this is based on what? If you, if you obey, that's what he said in verse 1. If you obey, God is waiting to bless you tremendously um, in these various ways. Then he says, starting in verse 15, but if you don't obey then God has made a covenant that there will be curses to come upon you. Uh, look in verse 15, But it shall come about, if you will not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And then he starts listing just the opposite of what he had listed under the blessings. And, and he starts telling them, this is the agreement, this is the arrangement. We don't have this specific arrangement today. 
right? We don't, we don't have um, a prosperity gospel as we sometimes talk about it. Sometimes the TV preachers and people will say, you know, if you do this or that for God, you'll, you'll be rich or you'll, you'll receive this or that. We don't have a promise like that under the New Testament. But they kind of did under the old. They had this blessing and cursing that said, you know what, as a nation at least, if you'll obey God, if you follow God, I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. And on the flip side, if you don't obey, you're going to have loss of these otherwise uh, blessings. Look at some of these examples. Look at verse 18. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body, or the fruit of your womb, and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd, and the young of your flock. Again, just the opposite. Cursed, uh, as he speaks of children, and the land, and the crops, and the individual prosperity that they would have if they were obedient, they'll have just the opposite uh, if they're not. Uh, they will not have military strength. Look down in verse 25. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them, but you shall flee seven ways before them. And you'll be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Uh, he says just the opposite. You will no longer have this military strength and... and um, you know, you see that, of course, as they, lots of examples of that as they're taking the promised land and as they're uh, living in the land and the battles that they fight um, and just these tremendous examples of them obeying God and Him giving them miraculous victories over, over Jericho and uh, different people that they, that they encountered. Um, and, and yet, on the other hand, when they are disobedient, God allowing uh, them to be punished, allowing nations to come in and run over them, ultimately carry them off uh, into captivity. And you'll even lose your national prosperity. Remember what he said under the blessing? He said, um, you'll, you will uh, lend to other nations uh, and not borrow. Uh, you'll be the wealthy nation. You'll be the one to whom other nations come for wealth. Well, if they don't obey God, it will be just the opposite. Look in verse 49 and following. The Lord will bring, this is under the curses, if you don't obey, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar. From the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, who shall have no respect for the old, nor shall show favor to the young. Moreover, it shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you're destroyed, who also leaves you no grain, new wine or oil, nor increase of your herd or the young of your flock until they've caused you to perish. This nation, you don't even understand their language. They're going to swoop down like an eagle. They're going to absolutely destroy you. He said, verse 52, it shall besiege you in all your towns and your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land, and it shall besiege you in your towns throughout your land which the Lord your God has given you. Then he, then he gets very graphic. He says, then you shall eat the offspring of your own body, the flesh of your sons and of your daughters whom the Lord your God has given you during the siege and the distress by which your enemy shall oppress you. The man who is refined and very delicate among you shall be hostile toward his brother and toward the wife he cherishes and toward the rest of his children who remain, so that he will not give even one of them any of the flesh of his children which he shall eat, since he has nothing left during the siege and the distress by which your enemy shall oppress you in all your towns. I will stop there, but, but you, he's being very graphic with them. And you know, uh, if you don't know, you can look it up in 2 Kings chapter 6. There's, a, there's an example of that where they're being besieged and things are so bad that that is in fact what they're doing. They are literally eating their children. And, and what my point in, is not just to be graphic, my, my point is to say when God makes a covenant, He what? He keeps it. This, this whole class is about covenants and about this question of can we rely on the promises of God?
Well, we can, and, and it's not just when God promises blessings, but it's when God promises curses, God promises punishment. Whatever God promises, He's going to do. And, and if, we, um, if, we, if we believe in God, if we, if we uh, trust in Him to be faithful, then, then we uh, need to know that He's going to be faithful in all things. And so um, our question is, you know, will we be faithful? God will keep His covenant. Our question is, you know, will we? That's the question of faith. Will we keep covenant with God? And um, we, we want to commit ourselves to Him. And so um, these are examples of those uh, promises uh, that God made in regard to blessing and cursing. Now, next week we will look briefly at that covenant with David. Again, I said these, these final kind of, um, not miscellaneous, but additional promises we're adding to that promise of Abraham, to Abraham. And that will conclude our, our study of the old covenant and we'll start moving toward this transition to the new. But they had now this covenant uh, law of Moses to govern them and the covenant of blessing and cursing that would judge them uh, as a nation. All right, let's stop there and let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we uh, are so grateful for your love and your care for us. We're grateful that you are a promise keeping, a covenant keeping God. Uh, we um, read uh, tonight, of just ended with reading things that are disturbing to read and even think about, and yet at the same time we read them to be reminded that um, you are faithful and that the agreements that you make, the covenants that you make with your people uh, are true and that you'll be true to them. And we thank you for that, Father because it's what gives us the confidence that the good things that you promised us are real, that heaven is real, that forgiveness is real, that our relationship with you is real. Thank you, Father, for that. Go with us this week, Father, and watch over us. Please forgive us as we fail you. We know we do, and we thank you for that forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.